According to Promise by Charles Spurgeon Section 5 Persecution Consequent on the Promise Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. But as then he was born after the flesh, persecuted him that was born after the Spirit, even so it is now. Galatians 4 Verses 28 and 29. When brothers differ so greatly as Ishmael and Isaac, it is not surprising if they fall out. They indulge unkind feelings. Ishmael was older than Isaac, and when the time came for Isaac to be weaned, his mother, Sarah, saw the son of the bondwoman mocking her child. So early had the difference of birth and condition begun to display itself this may serve as an indication of what we may expect if we possess the God-given life in our heirs, according to the promise. Those who are under the bondage of the law cannot love those who are free, born by the gospel, and in some way or other they soon display their enmity. We are not now thinking of the hostility between the wicked world and the church, but of that which exists between men of a merely natural religion and those who are born of God. We speak not of the Philistines opposing Isaac, but of his brother Ishmael mocking him. Keenest of all is this opposition of the externally religious to those who are born from above and worship God in spirit and in truth. Many precious children of God have suffered bitterly from the cruel hatred of those who profess to be their brethren. Probably the motive of Ishmael was envy. He could not endure that the little one should have preeminence over him. He seemed to say, this is the heir and therefore I hate him. Perhaps he mocked Isaac's heirship and boasted that he had as good a right to the estate as ever the child of the promise could have. Thus do mere professors envy the condition of believers and reckon themselves to be quite as good as the best of those who hope to be saved by the grace of God. They do not desire the grace of God themselves, and yet, like the dog in the manger, they cannot bear that others should have it. They envy the saints their hope, their peace of mind, and their enjoyment of the favor of God. If any of you find it so, be not in the least surprised. The envy of Ishmael displayed itself most at the great feast which had been made at his brother's waning. And even thus do formalists, like the elder brother in the parable, become most provoked when there is most occasion for rejoicing in connection with the father's beloved child. The music and dancing of the true family are gall and wormwood to proud, base-born professors. When full assurance is weaned from doubt, the holy delight is weaned from the world. Then the carnal religionists put on a sneer and calls the godly mad, or fanatical, or murmurs with sullen sarcasm, Poor fools, let them alone. They are a sadly deluded crew. People who are religious but not truly regenerated, who are working and hoping to be saved by their own merits, usually exhibit a bitter hatred toward those who are born of the promise. Sometimes they mock their feebleness. Maybe Ishmael called Isaac a mere baby just weaned. So are believers a feeble flock and exceedingly like to excite the derision of those who think themselves strong-minded. Isaac could not deny that he was weak. Neither can believers deny that they are faulty and are subject to infirmities which may put them under just censure. But the world makes more of this than justice will allow, and mocks at saints for weakness which in others would be overlooked 
we must not think it a strange thing if our insignificance and imperfection should set proud and self-righteous Pharisees jeering at us and our gospel. Frequently, the sport is raised by the believer's pretensions. Isaac was called the heir, and Ishmael could not bear to hear it. Look, says the legalist, yonder man was not long ago a known sinner. Now he says he has believed in Jesus Christ, and therefore he declares that he knows himself to be saved and accepted and sure of heaven. Did you ever hear such presumption? He who hugs his chains hates the presence of a free man. He who refuses the mercy of God because he proudly trusts his own merits is angry with the man who rejoices to be saved by grace. Perhaps the little Isaac, the child of such aged parents, seemed odd and strange to the young half-breed Egyptian. No person is so much a foreigner to his fellow men as a man born from above. To live by faith upon the promise of God ought to seem the most proper and natural thing in the world, but it is not so esteemed. On the contrary, men count those to be strange beings who believe in God and act upon such a belief. Wretched boys in the streets still hoot at foreigners, and men of the world still jest at true believers because of their unworldly spirit and conduct. To us, this is a testimony of good, for our Lord said, If ye were of the world, the world would love his own. But because ye are not of the world, therefore the world hateth you. In a thousand ways, many of them so petty as to be unworthy of mention, the believer can be made to bear trials of cruel mockings, and he ought to be prepared so to do. After all, it is but a small matter to be persecuted nowadays, for the fires of Smithfield are quenched. The Lollard's Tower contains no prisoners, and not even a thumbscrew remains in use. Courage, good brother. Even should you be ridiculed, no bones will be broken, and if you are brave enough to despise contempt, even your sleep will not be disturbed. Ishmael's mocking Isaac is only one among 10,000 proofs of the enmity which exists between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. The mixture of these two in Abraham's household came about through his going down into Egypt and acting in an unbelieving manner towards Pharaoh. Then the Egyptian bondwoman was given to Sarah, and the evil element came into the camp. Sarah, in an evil hour, gave the bondwoman to her husband. Hence, ten thousand tears. No association of the unregenerate with the church of God will avail to alter their nature. In Ishmael, in Abraham's encampment is Ishmael still. Today, the fiercest enemies of the truth of God are the aliens in our communion. These are they who make believers in sound evangelical teaching look like strangers in the churches which were founded on the basis of scriptural doctrine. They make us foreigners in our own land. They are lenient to all manner of heresy, but the believer in the doctrines of grace they sneer at as old-fashioned and bigoted. A belated mortal who ought studiously to seek out a grave and bury himself, yet will the man who trusts his God and believes in his covenant be able to survive all mockeries, for he counts the reproach of Christ greater riches than all the treasures of Egypt, it is by no means shameful to trust God. On the contrary, it is a point of honor with good men to trust in Him who is faithful and true, and if they have to suffer for it, they do so joyfully. Gird yourselves, therefore, with a holy courage, you who are learning through grace 
to live upon the promise of God by faith. Was not the great head of the family despised and rejected of men? Must not the rest of the brotherhood be conformed to the firstborn? If we are made partakers of Christ's sufferings, we shall be partakers of his glory. Wherefore, let us take heart and lot with the crucified heir of all things. End of section 5